אסטרופיזיקאי במקצועו. הוא נחשב ליורשו של המדען האמריקני הנודע קרל סייגן, שהצליח להפוך את היקום למוקד של עניין ציבורי עצום. המדען טייסון מדגיש, כאשר אני יוצא מביתי אני מרים את ראשי כלפי מעלה כדי לדעת מה קורה שם ביקום. צ'ארלי רוז מן התוכנית 60 דקות מספר על המדען שהפך להיות פופולרי ומושך המונים לאולמות לא פחות ואולי יותר מזמרי רוק. The good thing about science is that it's true whether or not you believe in it. We caught up with him in Seattle where he said a cosmic perspective could improve life on Earth. We in astrophysics, we think of the universe all the time. So to us, Earth is just another planet. From a distance, it's a speck. And I'm convinced that if everyone had a cosmic perspective, you wouldn't have legions of armies waging war on other people because someone would say, stop, look at the universe. So you've become the superstar of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> the status that you refer to is, I, I'm, I'm shocked by it every day, just every day. Every day I wake up and I look at my Twitter feed and... Two million, by the way. Two and a half million. Two and a half. Two, two and a half million. I'm thinking, I need to remind these people, hey, look, I'm an astrophysicist. Did I tell you that? You can, there's still time to back out. But for me, as an educator and as a scientist, what it tells me is that there really is an underserved curiosity in adults. To spark that curiosity, he told us this is the most mind-altering picture ever taken, shot 46 years ago from Apollo 8 while orbiting the moon. This was the first time any of us had seen Earth the way nature had intended, with oceans and land and clouds. So many of us had only ever seen Earth on a schoolroom globe, and so this is the birth of a cosmic perspective. And that idea should change our world. Back then, that idea did change our world. Earth Day was founded, uh, leaded gas was banned, DDT was banned. All of a sudden, people were thinking about Earth as, as a world that we're all in it together. We're thinking we're exploring the moon and we discovered the Earth for the first time. He's the head of the Hayden Planetarium in New York and lives in the city with his wife and two children. Tyson received his doctorate from Columbia. He says there are so few astrophysicists that they are literally one in a million. Please tell me what is an astrophysicist. In astrophysics, we care about how matter, motion, and energy manifest in objects and phenomenon in the universe. Stars are born, they live out their lives, they die, some of the ones that die explode. Our sun will not be one of those, but it will die, and it'll take Earth with us. So we make sure we have other destinations in mind when that happens. And I've got it on my, on my calendar. <laughs> <laughs> when is this going to happen? I want to make plans. <laughs> in about five billion years. And yeah. so we probably have other issues to concern yeah. ourselves with for our survival between now and then. You said, I am, we are stardust. Yes. What does that mean? For me, the most astonishing fact is that the molecules that comprise our body are traceable, are traceable to the crucibles of the centers of stars that manufactured these elements from lighter versions of themselves and then exploded, scattering this enrichment across the galaxy into gas clouds that would later collapse to form next generation star systems. One of those star systems was ours. These atoms and molecules are in us because in fact the universe is in us. And we are not only figuratively, but literally stardust. Tyson became most widely known hosting the television series, Cosmos. When we try to look even farther into the universe, we come to what appears to be the end of space. But actually, it's the beginning of time. Fans line up down the block to watch him record his radio show, Star Talk. The sun 
keeps all the planets on their appointed orbits, yet somehow manages to ripen a bunch of grapes as though it had nothing else in the world to do. Mm. Galileo. <laughs> Star Talk Radio, thank you. In April, Star Talk Radio also became a weekly cable television show. He is not in movies yet, but he becomes a movie critic when he spots a scene that's supposed to be scientifically accurate, but isn't. You saw the movie Titanic. Yes. Uh, and it was a scene where they're looking up at the stars. And you see it. It wasn't just a scene. The ship is sinking <laughs> at a longitude, latitude, time, date. We know it, and there's a, only one sky should have been over that, that sinking ship. And it wasn't. It was the wrong sky. But it was not only the wrong sky, they, like, made it up. And the left half of the sky was a mirror reflection of the right. So it's not only the wrong sky, it was a lazy sky. It's a movie. You really want to take me there? You want to say it again? Let me hear it. It's a movie. Okay. <laughs> they found the Titanic. They photographed the Titanic. They knew what the state rooms right, looked right, like right, and the right, China right. patterns. And the, so they set the standard. They required of me that I analyze it at that level. Instead of the fake sky, Tyson said the real sky would have looked like this. So in a later release, director James Cameron changed the sky to Tyson's specifications. Over there is the... And as for what's falling from the sky, he showed me a piece of an asteroid that he keeps in his office. And this is a rock from space. Oh my! <laughs> Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can feel just the weight of this thing. Oh, yeah. And this was part of a much larger asteroid that collided with Earth about 50,000 years ago. And so now imagine this about a million times larger going 40,000 miles an hour colliding with Earth. And you get a sense of the energy hmm. of what is out there. And that Earth is in a shooting gallery. And this is why we have to worry about asteroids. I should think so. Yes. <laughs> just bad, too. Tyson first became interested in the stars staring up at them from the roof of his apartment building. Now his playground is the Hayden Planetarium. The Milky Way is actually visible behind me here. This is the planetarium that changed his life when he was just nine years old. And you'd seen the sky from your roof? Well, from my roof in the Bronx. And I saw all dozen stars that are visible. <laughs> <laughs> On a good night, maybe 14 stars. And I come in here, and then they dim the light. And I said, wow. And it was the universe. When you walked out of this planetarium, mm -hmm. I mean, were you a different person because you were overwhelmed by the experience that you put your finger on it? I spent my entire life never knowing that such a sky existed. And then to be struck by it, to be starstruck by it. And after that day, I said, I want to learn more about it. Children keep changing their minds about what they want to be, but Tyson stuck with the stars. And if you ask me, as a kid at age 11, that annoying question that adults always ask kids, what is it? What do you want to grow up? I said I would say astrophysicist, yeah. and that pretty much shut everybody up. In the, room. <laughs> the universe is so amazing and so limitless, and who wouldn't want to study the universe? What was so amazing? The endless frontier of it all. The vastness of it. The mystery of it. But Tyson had to fight societal stereotypes to reach his goal. Because he is black, he said, teachers pushed him towards athletics, not astrophysics, which he called the path of most resistance. When I needed to overcome the low expectations of others or the, the, the bias that would be expressed in one circumstance or another, I keep on keeping on. And I climb over the obstacle, go around it, dig under it, fly over it. That's what kept me going. Otherwise, I would have never been an astrophysicist. At age 56, Tyson is still starstruck by both the sky and the planetarium that brought it to life. So imprinted was I by that sky that to this day, I go to mountaintops where the finest observatories in the world are located, and I say to myself, that reminds me of the Hayden Planetarium. <laughs> <laughs> and when you walk outside, wherever you are, do you look up? 
Any great time you walk outdoors. Any time I exit a building, I look up. I can tell you that kids, kids will look up when they come out, and it, adults just stop. They've, you know, we stop catching snowflakes in our mouth. We stop yeah. jumping into puddles, and I, I don't want to ever lose that. In life and in the universe, it's always best to keep looking up. <laughs> Uplifting what, what and upbeat, he is as a billion backstage as, billion as he is on it. Everyone should, their mind should be blown at least once a day. Uh, we're a moment away from opening the house with a half hour call to the top of the show. I am ready. <laughs> <laughs> the ceiling has spoken. <laughs> He relates easily to everybody. We have a question Watch here, I sir. connected Dr. Tyson, to this Dr. questioner. Tomlinson, I saw you a couple of years ago in Houston. Houston, the first word ever spoken from the surface of the moon. And, uh, yeah. Houston, Tranquility Base here, the eagle has landed. But Tyson upset a lot of people when he argued, in part, that Pluto was too small and insignificant to qualify as a planet, despite what we'd learned in school. I didn't kill Pluto, but I was an accessory. Yeah, uh, you were complicit. I, no, I was, yeah, I was, I drove the getaway car, perhaps. That's all I'll admit to. Yeah. He got hate mail from elementary school students, including this letter he read during his performance in Seattle. Why can't Pluto be a planet? Some people like Pluto. And if it doesn't exist, then they don't have a favorite planet. Like, please write back, but not in cursive, because I can't read cursive. His big finish is often this picture of Earth, taken from the Cassini spacecraft, showing Earth as a tiny dot under Saturn's rings. Carl Sagan would ultimately write a book called The Pale Blue Dot where he waxed poetic about its meaning and significance. I want to end with a recitation from the Book of Carl. <laughs> if you look at Earth from space, you see a dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. It underscores the responsibility to deal more kindly and compassionately with one another and to preserve and cherish that pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. Thank you all.